now I've started to, uh, you know, those words of Bill Walsh have been resonating with me a little bit, and so I just had it in the back of my mind that there would probably be a transition upcoming. Um, Help train Ben Sherrington, who's, who's more than capable of taking over as my successor. And, uh, you know, once we got through the season, all of a sudden we were in a position at the Red Sox to have to hire a new manager. I felt like that was something that was best done by uh, Ben because he was going to be there for the long haul. And uh, then when the Cubs called, um, frankly, that really got my attention uh, because of the history, because of the tradition, because of the Ricketts commitment to winning. Uh, because of the ballpark and the fans and because of the fact that uh, we haven't won a World Series in a really, really, really long time. You know, the two best parts of my job of, of, of the last decade that I have with the Red Sox, the first thing was helping to build a scouting and player development machine, you know, from the, from the ground floor, you know, getting in the trenches with the guys and helping write the player development manual, the scouting manual, building it from the ground up and ultimately helping to produce big league players that uh, helped us win games. And, and, the, and, the, and the other great thing, uh, probably the best, the best part of being with the Red Sox was playing a small part in winning that World Series in 2004 and getting to see the looks on people's faces, the joy that it brought them, the <coughs> families that were hanging Red Sox pennants on, on, on the graves and cemeteries, that, that ride from Logan Airport to Fenway Park where we saw business men and women stopping in the middle of the street when they saw our bus getting out and hugging each other, you know, construction workers hugging each other up on top of buildings. And uh, it, it really impacted um, a whole region of the country and generations of families. So the Cubs opportunity... Uh, provides me a forum, provides us a forum to do both those things. We can build a scouting and player development operation from the ground up, do it together, and, and end up having lots of players come through the system under the Cubs' way, play right here at Wrigley. And, you know, uh, if, when we build that foundation for sustained success and it ultimately results in a World Series, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more than just a World Series. It's going to impact a lot of people, a lot of Cubs fans, a lot of Cubs families who for generations have waited and waited for a World Series. So um, you know, the two best things about my Red Sox experience, I may have a chance to, uh, to try to recreate here. So sure, it got my attention and, and uh, made me consider making that move. Uh, David, with respect to the, the part of your question addressed to me, the, um, I really had no idea. Um, you know, we just had to, uh, you know, we, we went through our analysis and I looked at it and I said, well, before we move forward, I want to go see if there's a, there's a chance that, uh, that we can talk to Theo. After about um, 10 or 15 minutes of our conversation, I knew this was the guy that, that we needed here. So uh, we're just, uh, after that, it was just a matter of um, just, you know, going through the process and executing. Uh, Theo Sahadi Sharma, ESPN Chicago. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. you. Talk about a change in philosophies. One of the things the Cubs were probably farthest behind in respect to the Red Sox is statistical analysis. Can you just talk about how important that aspect is to building a winning team and how you'll go about building that part of the front office? Sure. Um, well, my personal approach is that uh, the best organizations use both traditional scouting at its best and objective analysis at its best, and um, you can kind of you can look at each of those uh, paradigms as as a lens through which to view the player. So, if you hire the best scouts, put them in a position to see the players uh, at the right time, and get good, solid, accurate scouting reports, you see the player through through a strong traditional scouting lens. If you hire the best analysts, uh, get get the most accurate data, make, the, mo make the, the best adjustments, do the most thorough analysis, and you come out with uh, the best available uh, statistical information, that's another lens, an objective lens through which to view the player. But the, the, the way to see the player most accurately, the, to get the truest picture of the player, is to put both those lenses together and look through them simultaneously, and you get uh, a pretty darn accurate uh, picture of the player. So. That, that, that was my uh, approach as I came up through the game, you know, literally sitting between the scouting director and the, and the stats analyst at the Padres, and that's how I, I formed my way of looking at the game. That's the approach we tried to uh, use at the Red Sox, and uh, I'd like to bring that same approach here with the Cubs. Theo, Mike Dodd from USA Today. Uh, in the short term, with, with the play of payroll you'll have to work with next year, will it be higher or lower, about the same as the Cubs had this year? 
Sure. Well, I have a personal policy. The Boston writers will know this well. I have a personal policy of uh, never commenting at all on uh, on player payroll issues. I just think it's to the club's advantage to to not promulgate any of that information or talk about our future plans. But I'll say this, as I said earlier, uh, there are more than enough resources here to win. Um, there, there are tremendous revenues, and uh, we'll have a very significant uh, amount of resources on the baseball side to allocate as we see fit. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's all going to go into Major League Payroll right away. Um, there could be an opportunity to do that. It depends how the market plays itself out, and I'll have more, a better feel for that after I dig deeper about uh, the organization and our needs. But it could be that we allocate some, some of those resources to the draft internationally, to building up uh, an even better infrastructure for scouting and player development. So there, there are a lot of resources here, and ultimately it will be up to us with the decisions that we make over time to put them to good use. Theo, Phil Rogers, Chicago Tribune again. Um, while you say you have more than enough resources to win, and while the Red Sox were close when you got there as a, or were promoted to GM, mm -hmm. uh, Fenway Park today looks totally different than it did 10 years ago, and the Red Sox have tapped into revenue streams in that decade that have been just marked. Uh, how much of your optimism in uh, thinking you can succeed here is tied into the ability to replicate that success on the business side well i know you're a baseball guy it certainly has impact yeah well yeah i'm, I'm a bit of a purist when it comes when it comes to the game so I, I i'm truly lucky to uh to have had the opportunity to work at fenway park for 10 years and incredibly lucky to to call wrigley field home now these are my those are my two favorite ballparks uh in the game yeah you know, i'll just say this you know, during my time with the red sox um i got to see how important it was um, to, to renovate the ballpark. And when, when I, even growing there as a kid uh, through the 80s and into the 90s, the park had started to fall into disrepair a little bit. It was, it was still a great place, but it wasn't as great a place to watch a game as, as maybe it had been earlier. And I was lucky in, in getting there in 2002. Um, that was right around the time that the, the renovation started, and the impact was tremendous. Uh, it improved the fan experience. Uh, fantastically it generated revenues uh, at a remarkable clip and then that in turn allowed us on the baseball side to take those revenues uh, and pour them into our baseball operation which allowed us to, to get to the level we wanted to be and stay there and and beyond that uh, it, it it had a significant impact on the city you know, Fenway Park became this jewel of Boston that everyone who came to town uh, had to see and had to experience and so now, sure, you know, if, we, if we're lucky enough to uh, follow they, those same steps here in Chicago with Wrigley Field, it will only mean great things for the fans, great things for our revenues, which in turn means great things for our baseball operations, and, and a great thing for the city of Chicago. Theo, Christina Carl from ESPN.com. Uh, welcome to Chicago. Thank you. From Jim Fry to Jim Hendry, uh, there's been a lot of money spent on post-prime free agents in Cubs history. I'm curious about how you're interested in changing the dynamic in terms of attracting the very best to this team in this market? So I couldn't hear the whole question. It was about post-prime post free agents and changing no. that. How do you want to change the dynamic or how do you anticipate changing the dynamic to attract the very best on the market to this team in this market? Okay. Um, well, I, th I think, you know, baseball players, uh, have a prime age, you know, there's an age range, um, you know, starting somewhere around 26, 27, ending somewhere around 31, 32, that uh, in which you get the, the best production, the, the best bang for your buck with the player. So, um, you know, clearly we're going to have a diversified roster with uh, a lot of young players under control. We're going to have some players through their arbitration years, and we're sure to have some veterans uh, in their free agent years as well. I think if we do our jobs the right way, um, we'll have as many uh, players in their prime, hopefully homegrown, impact-type players who are moving into their prime years and still in their prime years. I think that's the best formula to build a winning baseball club. Now, that said, there's an important role for veterans uh, and veteran leadership. And I, th I think the key is to make sure that you pay, and I've learned this lesson through the years the hard way as well, the key is to pay for future performance, not for past performance. Theo, uh, Al Hamnick from the Times in Northwest Indiana. Welcome to our city. Thank you. Uh, you've accomplished a lot of great things early in your life. 
what's the quality or trait that you feel you possess that separates you from a lot of other leaders in the game? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, ability to stay inconspicuous at Starbucks in the Chicago <laughs> area, maybe, or maybe not, maybe not so much in hindsight. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've had my colleagues tell me, my friends tell me in the game that it's competitiveness. That uh, you know, I think a lot of people in, in the game are competitive. But I'm, if I was being honest with myself, I'd I'd say I'm probably hyper competitive, uh, maybe overly driven to succeed, and uh, and along the same. But but at the same time, I don't like to do it individually. I like to um, get into a bunker with a group of people that I believe in and who believe in me as a leader, develop a, a vision that we can that we share, uh, and then work our tails off in order to see it through and implement it on the field. You know, there's nothing better in the game than, than uh, sitting back there and watching players pour champagne over another and even the, you know, the guys in the front office and the scouts and the field staff pour champagne on one another and know that you, know, you were there, they were there, working the long nights, putting the hard work in to play a small role and helping to make that happen. So I think my competitiveness and my desire to be part of a group united by a common goal, two characteristics that I think have served me well in some, in, in some capacities. Theo, uh, Matt Abaticola, 670 the score. How do you begin moving forward with the organization in teaching a uniform approach to how baseball is done? And what's a realistic timetable to understanding that the entire organization is moving forward in that direction? Yeah. Well, I think the, the first step is to... Well, there are two first steps. One, and I mentioned this earlier, one is to actively pursue the best and the brightest uh, out there from other organizations, you know, true impact personnel that we can, that we can bring in to, to immediately make us a better organization. And the second step is to sit down with uh, the talented people here uh, who have served the Cubs well for, for so long. I know there's a lot I can learn from them not just about how the Cubs have operated and things the Cubs do well and things the Cubs do better, but I can learn about the game from them. You know, th this, in this game, uh, there are no definitive answers. You know, if you think you've got it all figured out in this game, you get humbled really quickly. So I look forward to sitting down with the, with the folks that we have here, bringing in the best and the brightest from outside, forming a cohesive unit, and then, and then the next step is sit down and define that vision. There's not one way to play this game. It's, it's a dy you know, the Cubs way will be a dynamic, living, breathing entity that changes every year. We're going to add to our scouting manual and our player development every year through insights that we develop, through hard work and research, and also through mistakes that we've made and learned to take some things out of that approach. So it's going to start immediately uh, with, with the people, and then we'll build the processes around that and move forward. We'll do two more questions before breaking into smaller groups. Theo, Megan Monmiro with the Northwest Herald. During your discussions, did you have any hesitations or concerns about accepting this position? Um, no, you know, I had uh, I had some some skepticism going in just because I had such a great situation in Boston, and as I discussed earlier, I knew I was probably nearing the end of my tenure there just because I thought it was important to look for the next challenge, and I thought it was important for the Red Sox to, to have the benefit of uh, the true change that can come from a new perspective. Um, but, you know, the more I learned about the Cubs, uh, the more I learned about the Ricketts family, the more I learned about uh, a lot of the people over here, uh, the more interested I was. And, you know, dating back to uh, my time as a kid, watching some games on WGN, I was a Red Sox fan all the way. Um, but, you know, seeing those games on GN, the day games, you come home right after school and they're on, yeah, I developed this sort of romantic notion of the Cubs and, and what they were all about and Wrigley Field and the history and the tradition and clearly the, uh, the fact that uh, we haven't won the World Series in a long time. And it was nice for me that uh, the reality you know, what I learned about ownership and the fans and, and the vision here matches up with that romantic vision I have and, and uh, that this was the right place to come to. Theo, Alex Spear with WEI.com. Um, a two-part question, so I'll sneak one in on you. Um, obviously, there's, this is a new challenge and a new opportunity, as you referred to, but structurally, how is this different and what was, what was appealing about this job structurally versus the one you had in Boston? And the second part is, what's this been like the last couple of weeks just kind of in this, uh, I don't know if it would be characterized as limbo or this kind of in-between 
liminal state uh, that you've been in? Sure. Uh, I guess I'll answer the second part first. Um, the last couple of weeks have been uh, interesting. Um, I was telling, we had a, a front office meeting yesterday. Uh, I got to meet the, the whole front office, and I was telling them that I felt like uh, that guy in the movie Office Space with this the red stable and stapler who just keeps, when I was at Fenway Park, you know, you just keep showing up to work, and it was as if someone forgot to tell me that I didn't work there anymore. So I, I did end up in the basement with just a cubicle and a stapler, and then I knew it was time to go to Chicago. Um, but it was fun. You know, I knew the organizations uh, were doing the best they could and, and that, you know, the relationships were solid on both sides and that eventually it would get worked out, and it did. Uh, your first question about structural. How is this job different from the one that you Yeah, you know, this, uh, this job allows me to, to uh, lead baseball operations, gives me sort of wide, um, a wide net of responsibilities to to make decisions, allocate resources as as I see fit within baseball operations, as as was the case in Boston to a large extent. Um, there's some additional responsibilities here. I'm going to serve as the uh, uh, baseball liaison to the business side and work closely with with, uh, with Crane, uh, uh, leading the organization forward. We have a number of uh, projects under development uh, in the Dominican Republic, in Mesa, uh, eventually here at, here at Wrigley. And uh, I will uh, be involved in helping seeing those th through to fruition. And with Wrigley, I'll be involved in all the baseball elements um, of, uh, of the work that we're going to do here. So it's, uh, it's a great job. I'm perfectly happy with it. You know, I came here to join the Cubs and to help, the help build that foundation and help the Cubs win. Um, I didn't come here for a title or for anything else. It, um, but I'm perfectly, perfectly happy with uh, the structure and, and even happier about the people I'll be working with. Thank you all for joining us, Tom. Thank you, Theo. Thanks, thank guys. you. Appreciate Congratulations it. Congratulations and welcome you. aboard.